May I invite us to open our Bibles today, Mark's Gospel, the 15th chapter, Mark's Gospel, chapter 15. In a moment, we're going to be looking at verses 21 through 32 and following. While you're turning there, let me remind us what we find in what I call Countdown to Calvary, Passion Week. We have looked at a truncated series in this Easter season for to cover entire Passion Week as I have outlined it in my book, Countdown to Calvary. There's 11 in the series, 11 messages or 11 chapters as found in the book on Countdown to Calvary. As I have expanded that even beyond the publication, there's about 13 parts to do justice to it. And so we have truncated that in four or five studies. So you understand that we've not covered every portion of Passion Week, the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ, going through his last week, his humanity and the frailty in his humanity of what he faced. While you have uh, turned in your Bibles to the 15th chapter, in a moment we'll read verses 21 and following. Let me give us a little uh, historic overview of what has taken place, what we call Palm Sunday, the Sunday that the Lord Jesus Christ enters into Jerusalem riding on the back of a donkey to fulfill the prophetic text of how he would come in lowly and humbly as the servant king. And we see ultimately he is the Savior King in his resurrection. That's on Sunday when he comes into Jerusalem. On Monday, you find uh, chronologically He curses the fig tree and he cleanses the temple. On Tuesday, it is perhaps the longest day in the teaching ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. On Tuesday, Jesus teaches his disciples, and I've made made mention of this. Let me just insert this at this point. Jesus, knowing that this is the last week on earth that he'll have with his disciples, he packs it filled. He fills every moment of that week with teaching his disciples because he realizes it will be the last opportunity in his physicality. He teaches them about faith. He teaches them about the condition of Israel and the future of Israel. He teaches them about paying taxes. That's a pretty interesting text, by the way. He teaches them about uh, the future resurrection. He teaches them about the greatest commandment, and that commandment is love. He teaches them about his deity and who he is as God come in the flesh. He teaches them about giving of uh, that uh, amount that we have that honors God. He teaches them about future events. We call it theologically eschatological teaching. He teaches them about all that's going to happen to the very end and the culmination of the world. That's all on Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, the Lord Jesus is anointed with that precious, priceless, pure perfume in preparation for his uh, burial, he says in that 14th chapter on Wednesday. He also, it's the time when Judas complains about what is spent on that perfume and his uh, uh, greed and gravis as to how it ought to have been spent. And then on Thursday, the celebration of Passover the celebration of the Passover meal with his disciples, the final supper. We call it the Last Supper. And in that Last Supper, the Lord Jesus Christ inaugurates, institutes the Lord's Supper that we celebrate symbolically speaking of his death, burial, and resurrection. Then uh, he leaves the uh, gate uh, and crosses the Kidron Valley, goes into the Mount of Olives, into the Garden of Gethsemane, And there he prays with his disciples. As you uh, perhaps have studied the text and realized, he goes into the garden and he prays. And the scripture says he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Uh, That is, in his humanity, he is suffering the anguish of realizing just hours before him what he must uh, endure on Calvary's cross. In the Garden of Gethsemane, on Thursday, late at the evening and up into the night, He is uh, betrayed by Judas there in the garden. 
a kiss is placed on his uh, cheek to represent to the soldiers, this is the one, this is Jesus, this is the one that you arrest, and uh, they arrested the Lord Jesus Christ. And from the wee hours uh, in Thursday night and the early hours of Friday morning, the Lord Jesus Christ goes through three major trials, each one with two parts, six trials, all of which are illegal, all of which are against Roman law because it's at night. And without proper witnesses, the Lord Jesus Christ is tried, convicted, and ready to be crucified. He's arrested. We hours, early hours of Friday morning, then on Friday, from late Thursday night to early Friday morning during that time of his illegal trials, and then you find uh, the text that is before us today, his crucifixion. Would you stand together? Out of honor and recognition of the reading of the word, beginning with verse 21 of chapter 15, the gospel according to Mark. We read these words. And then they compelled one Simon of a Cyrenian who passed by coming out of the country, the father, his father Alexander and Rufus to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour. It's about nine o'clock in the morning. And they crucified him. And the superscription of the accusation was written over the king, over the king of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two thieves the one on the right hand and the other on the left. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priest mocking said uh, among themselves with the scribes, he saved others, Himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Elaha, Elaha, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them stood by when they heard it, said, Behold, he called it for Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the scripture says in verse 38, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Thank you and we may be seated. You know, I don't say this in a con condemnatory fashion, but in modern society today, it's not an unusual thing to find a cross as a piece of jewelry. It's not an unusual thing to find a cross uh, uh, on a uh, dresser or something where it stands as an ornament or as a statue of some type uh, to be admired and to be looked at. But may I remind us, uh, uh, the cross that the Lord Jesus Christ hung on represented suffering and shame and scorn and scandal because the Lord Jesus Christ suffered it all, suffered your sins and mine, that we might be saved through his shed blood. Today the cross is used as that emblem of beauty and jewelry. But in the scripture, it was a symbol of death and pain and agony and suffering. I want us to think for a moment as we look at this unit of thought, the suffering 
of the cross, the suffering of the cross. As you might recall uh, in the study of the text that have uh, text that's gone before us, we've looked at uh, the servant of the cross, the shout of the cross, the sadness of the cross, the sorrow of the cross, the scandal of the cross, and some of the texts that we've not looked at, but I've given you an overview of, uh, we've looked at the scorn of the cross, and then ultimately the silence of the cross because when the Lord Jesus Christ stands before Pilate and the accusation is made and uh, the claims are placed against him, he openeth not his mouth, as is said in Isaiah chapter 53 in the prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ when he's crucified and when he's tried, he is silent before his accusers and there is not a word spoken on his, in his defense on his behalf. So I want us to notice four things as we think on the subject, the suffering of the cross. First of all, I want us to look at the place of the cross recorded. Secondly, I want us to see the people of the cross reviewed. And thirdly, the pain of the cross recorded. And then the purpose of the cross reminded. I want us to notice first of all in verse 21 and 22, the place of the cross recorded. Notice the scripture says there, and they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian who passed by coming out of his out of the country, his father of Alexander and Rufus to bear the cross, his cross, and they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. Uh, you've uh, considered the cross, and I don't know if we've thought about the cross, if we've considered really the impact of what the cross means. Uh, What is the cross all about? Why the cross? Uh, Why did the Lord Jesus Christ have to die on Calvary's cross? The plan was not some afterthought of God. It wasn't plan B because plan A failed somehow. According to Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, and other places it's found in the Scripture, Jesus was slain from before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, God the Father made a decision that he would come as God the Son and die on Calvary's cross, shed his rich red royal blood on Calvary for your sins and for mine. May I remind us, God knew that man would yield to Satan and would ultimately sin, and he planned before the foundation of the world that he would send his Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, to die on the cross for our sins. But notice the suffering of the Savior. First of all, Jesus does not carry his cross. Now, that's a conflict, some say, in the Scripture, and it's not that at all. In fact, in uh, John 19, 17 says of Jesus, And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of the skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. But we find in this text someone else carried the cross. Both are correct. It's not somehow, some way that God's made an error in his word. Both are correct. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ, because he's been beaten, he has suffered and endured the agony and the pain with the emaciated body, and as he's trying to carry the cross, he fell under the weight of the cross. We're told by historians that the cross was perhaps a 100 plus pounds, and the Lord Jesus Christ struggling to try to carry that after having been beaten to a pulp and his rib cage opened uh, uh, as a result of the 39 nine lashes uh, with the cat of nine tails and here's the Lord Jesus Christ trying to carry the cross he cannot carry it physically in his humanity and in his uh, weakness uh, humanly speaking they then got this one Simon uh, a Cyrenian to carry the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ you recall that he had been spat upon the crown of thorns had been placed upon his head uh, he had gone through that long sleepless night uh, uh, with his disciples and uh, praying with them in the garden of Gethsemane and as you recall the study of uh, his being in the garden of Gethsemane while he's praying and he had asked them to wait uh, Peter, James and John and he came back and they had fallen asleep the third time he says watch while I go in and pray he came back the third time and he simply said sleep on sleep on and then immediately Jesus Christ is arrested and at six trials he goes through approximately 3 a.m. Uh, when the arrest takes place and it's just uh, after daybreak then uh, that Jesus Christ is uh, to carry the cross as a result of his trials and being found guilty Jesus Christ indeed suffers as our suffering savior the pain and the agony uh, for you and for me the one that bears the sins for us. Jesus was so weak and so worn and so bruised, wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. Isaiah 53 tells us, 
Can you imagine carrying that cross? As I call it, the cold, callous, roughly hewn Roman cross. Can you imagine carrying that cross and the weight of it in his pain-stricken body? And as a result of that, it pressing against the lacerated skin and the torn muscles, his loss of blood and his weakened condition so that he could not carry the cross. And he uh, uh, fell under the load and they got someone else to carry the load for him. Notice, not only do we see the suffering of the Savior, but notice the service of Simon, as I call it. Notice the scripture there says, and they compel forced into service for Jesus, they compel one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus to bear the cross. Literally, he was impressed into service. Under Roman culture and Roman law of that day, if a Roman soldier were to be on the sidewalk, didn't have sidewalks, our vivification for other understanding, if he were on the sidewalk and you're passing by, he could compel you to carry his baggage for him. And the scripture is very, very clear. Uh, the scripture tells us in Matthew 5, 41, and whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain, that is two miles. Jesus said, if you put it in the vernacular for today, Jesus said the first mile is out of law because Roman culture demands it. So if they, the Roman soldier demands it, you carry it one mile out of law, but the second mile you carry it out of love. Love for the Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to his word. And that's what's taking place. Simon the Cyrenian is there perhaps uh, as a result of Passover week. Perhaps he had uh, come into the city and found it uh, swollen to the uh, limits uh, with uh, people because of Passover week. And here he is compelled into service. Simon, a Cyrenian Jew there uh, as a result of his Passover celebration, compelled to carry the cross for the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if you do this. I do. Why did Mark, in Mark's gospel, mention his name and mention his family members? Why did that take place? Mark mentions his two sons, uh, Alexander and Rufus, perhaps to suggest that they, these people, this family, uh, perhaps were known by others in that culture and in that day. He wants you to know who this was that was forced into service for serving the Lord Jesus. I just made a little marginal note that causes me to think for a moment about that. Here is uh, uh, this man that is forced into serving the Lord Jesus. He is compelled to carry the cross for Jesus. May I remind us when we serve the Lord Jesus Christ, it ought not be out of compulsion. It ought to be based on the fact that because of what he has done for us and we love him so much, we're willing to surrender our time and our talent, our treasure under the lordship of Jesus Christ, surrender our strength and surrender our intellect, surrender uh, the gifts and talents and abilities he's given us under his lordship as we serve him. We see the suffering of the Savior and the service of Simon, but I want you to notice the sight of the skull in verse 22. And they bring him unto the place Golgotha, which being interpreted the place of a skull, just outside the city of Jerusalem, beyond the north wall, a barren rocky hill that looked like a skull. It's called Golgotha, the Latin word meaning Calvary. Calvary. There's an old song that comes to mind, old song that says, on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, and I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I'll cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. The road leading to Calvary was called in that day, and many writers refer to it today, the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrow or the way of suffering, and that uh, identifies the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus went to Calvary's cross for your sins and for mine. He died on Calvary that we might live through our faith and trust in him and the shed blood there on Calvary, the place of the cross recorded. But I want you to notice in verse 23 and following, the people of the cross reviewed. The people of the cross reviewed. Who are these that are there at the cross? Now understand in the context of the text that we're looking at, we identify some of them. 
there are those that are identified further in the latter portion of the 15th chapter of the gospel according to Mark that are standing afar off and watching. There are those that are standing at the foot of the cross and watching. But I'm talking about those that have uh, the part and parcel of what's taking place here, uh, the people and the soldiers, etc., etc. But I want us to notice, first of all, as we look at those that were at the cross that day, there are three basic groups of people that are mentioned that were at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, we see the soldiers. Verse 23 through 26. Notice the scripture says in verse 23 and following. And they, speaking of the soldiers, gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they, speaking of the soldiers, had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lot upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Notice the soldiers there. Uh, notice uh, what the scripture says in relationship to it. Let's back up for a moment, look at verse 16. We're not covered this in our pulpit uh, teaching. But verse 16, the scripture tells us this. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called uh, Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. And they uh, clothed him, the soldiers clothed him with purple and plaited, plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and began to salute him, hailed king of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him and bowing their knees worshipped him. It's out of false, phony worship, not real worship. And they that had mocked him, uh, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. May I remind us the soldiers at the cross. They were simply doing their job. They were callous, cold soldiers. They were under the direction of the leadership of the government in that day. They were simply carrying out that which they were required to do. I made a note said they were just simply sin-hardened men doing their job, doing what they were told to do in crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice the soldiers and what they did in that 23rd verse. I call it the sedative because it was customary in that day when someone was being crucified and that was the most uh, horrific form of punishment and death that could be found in that era and that time was by way of crucifixion. So they provided, uh, they tried to provide for Jesus a sedative that would weaken and diminish the pain. They offered Jesus something that would sedate him, something to deaden the pain, but Jesus refused. May I remind us, Jesus wanted to be in full control of his faculties. He wanted to be in full control of what was taken taking place there on Calvary, even in his uh, humanity, he was still 100% deity. It could never be said that somehow, some way, Jesus didn't know what he was doing. It could not be said somehow, some way, by some loose likes lost liberal that he was sedated and therefore he didn't know what he was saying when we come to the seven statements, seven words spoken of from the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our suffering Savior. Not only do we see the sedative, but notice the stakes. The stakes, in verse 24, these sin-hardened soldiers sat around Jesus' cross and gambled for his garments. They did not uh, know what they were doing, but they knew that it was customary for the ones that carried out the act of a crucifixion. They had the what was called in that custom the booty. That which was, uh, that belonged to that person. Anything that were personal belongings or garments or clothing, they had the right to take it and share it. What did they want? What Jesus had is what they wanted. In fact, John 19, verse 23 and 24 says, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also the coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And that was the fulfillment, by the way, of the scripture spoken of in Psalms 22, verse 18, where they had cast lots for my garments. These sin-hardened soldiers were not even conscious, not even aware that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua, Messiah, Savior, Lord, is the one that they were crucifying. The same is true today. In the sin-darkened hearts of the majority of the people around the globe today do not recognize the Lord Jesus Christ as God come in the flesh, as Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. People are sin-soaked and sin-hardened today. The Bible, the church, and the preaching of the Word seems to have no effect on them whatsoever. In fact, what we celebrate as Passover week, as Easter week, as celebration of the death, buried, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the overwhelming part of the world does not recognize it. They simply view 
it as a day to party, a time to get together, and have they will have nothing to do with the Savior of the cross. But notice, notice in that text, the superscription in verse 25 and 26. It was customary in that day when someone was crucified, they would put a sign over the head of the one being put to death, his title or his name, or the complaint or accusation for him. And over the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, they put the king of the Jews. Usually that condemned person would have a sign that will give the charges against him or the name of the individual or the charges that's brought against him and being found guilty. Jesus was charged and condemned for claiming to be, as they put it, the king of the Jews. There was no recognition that Jesus Christ did not uh, come into the world to ultimately ascend to the throne and be called king. Jesus Christ did not uh, simply assume the title king. Jesus Christ is born king of of the world. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. Not only the king of the Jews, he's the king of the world. He is the king of the universe. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He didn't have to buy the position. He didn't have to assume or send to the position. He was born king of the Jews. The Bible says that there is coming a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is king that he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Philippians 2.10. The question is, have you confessed Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord? Do you know today the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ? Is he your King? Do you know him as Savior? Have you confessed him and asked him to forgive you of your sins, not only the soldiers, but I want you to notice the sentenced verse 27 and 28. Notice the sentence. Notice what the scripture says in those two verses. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on the right hand and the one on the left. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Listen to what the scripture is saying. Jesus is crucified between two sentenced men, sentenced to die on Calvary's cross. I want to read you what Luke's gospel says in relation to that. Luke 23, verse 38 and following. And a superscription was written over him, the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So uh, on Calvary's brow, on Mount Golgotha, the day that the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. There were three crosses on Calvary's cross. There were three crosses there on that day. Jesus Christ in the middle. And on each side was a thief that was dying for his charges and his condemnation. One on one side railed against Jesus and made fun of Jesus. If you uh, can't claim that you can do what you've uh, said that you can do, remove yourself and also take us down off the cross. And the other one spoke back. Can you imagine that? Here's Jesus in the middle. Here are these two dying men that's being crucified crucified and one is railing and arguing against the other and one says why don't you recognize that we are getting what we rightly deserve this man speaking of Jesus Christ has done nothing amiss he's done nothing that deserves what he has uh, gotten to be hanged here on the cross it is the cross of rebellion the one that says uh, rebelling against Jesus even in his death. One is the cross of repentance. One is repenting of his sins and says, remember me when you come into paradise. And Jesus says, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. There's the cross of redemption in the center. 
the cross of repentance on one side and the cross of rebellion on the other side. One preacher said on one occasion, one man died in sin, one man died to sin, and one man died for sin. Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, King of kings and Lord of lords, there on Calvary's cross on that day. I made just a little marginal note. I thank God for the middle cross, the cross of redemption through the suffering of our Savior, the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. His blood makes it white as snow. He died for your sins and for mine. Whatever they are, whatever has happened in the past, no matter how dark, no matter how uh, dreadful, no matter how uh, damaging that sin may have been, that sin may be, there's no sin too deep, too dark, too desperate that cannot be forgiven by the shed blood through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It should cause every child of God, every Christian to rejoice in the realization that our sins have been remitted, our sins have been propitiated, our sins have been covered through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There's an old song that says, Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, marvelous grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. The soldiers, the sentenced, but I want you to notice in verse 29 and following, the scoffers, the scoffers. First of all, we see the scoffers, the crowd, the crowds, that is the common people. Notice the scripture says, and they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, ah, oh, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Just the common average citizen passing by and seeing. They knew what Jesus had been charged with. They knew what the condemnation had been said about him. They knew that he was crucified with others that were considered thieves and criminals. And so as they listen, here's Jesus Christ, God come in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ hanging with his arms outstretched there on Calvary's cross. And as the average person would pass by, there seemed to be no one that looked at him sorrowfully. There, were no, there seemed to be no one that would look at him in sympathy. There was no one that looked at him in sen the sense of this is wrong, it ought not to be done. But the average common person walking by and seeing Jesus, they would wag their heads and wag their tongues and and point their fingers and accuse the Lord Jesus Christ of something less than who he was. They just shook their heads, spoke words of slander and derision, verbalizing the false charges against him. May I remind us, the Lord Jesus Christ could have called 10,000 angels and released him from the cross. The crowds passed by and scoffed at Jesus. Jesus and Jesus' followers were scoffed at and ridiculed then just as being scoffed at and ridiculed today. Not only the crowds, the common people, but the chief priest in verse 31 and 32, the chief priest. Those religious leaders, listen to what the scripture says. Likewise, just like the common people, just like the crowds, wagging their heads, sh shooting out their tongues, speaking ill, reviling words against the Lord Jesus Christ. Likewise, also, the chief priest, mocking, said among themselves, with the scribes, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe, and they that were crucified with him reviled him. Speaking of the two thieves, criminals on both sides. Here's the picture. The chief priests, the scribes, literally the uh, religious leaders and the law teachers made fun of Jesus, mocking Jesus, accusing the Lord Jesus Christ of being hapless and helpless and could do nothing about it. Little did they realize, little did they understand who they had crucified and who is hanging there on Calvary's cross some 2,000 years ago. Little did they realize that this is God come in the flesh that created them, that gives every breath and every heartbeat that they have that allows them to be sustained in what is called life. And 
In fact, I find it fascinating. And I do a deeper study on some of these verses and separate messages. I find it fascinating in that 32nd verse. Literally what they're saying, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders and the uh, scribes of the law, the religious leaders and those that are uh, viewed as being the knowledgeable people, uh, people in relationship to God and about God, they make fun and they say, now let him come down from the cross that we might believe. They're saying, Jesus, if you'll come off the cross, if you'll perform a miracle, if you'll show us a sign, then we'll believe. Listen, folks, we have a world today that has the philosophy, Jesus just show me a sign, a miracle, or a wonder, and I'll believe. That's not the methodology that the Lord Jesus Christ uses according to the Scripture. God does not use that methodology for us to believe. Belief is by faith. Faith is that which we do not see, have not seen, do not understand, but simply accept because God does it. It doesn't take a sign, miracle, or wonder uh, for a person to say yes to Jesus Christ. There are those in major mainline denominations today that look for some ecstatic utterance or some leaping over a pew or something that is unusual or something that is uh, considered a sign or a miracle, and they say, then I'll believe. That's what these people were saying then. These that were supposed to be the religious leaders and those of the theological teachers, they were saying, Jesus, just prove to us who you are. Prove to us that you're really God, and then we'll believe. May I remind us, not only we see the crowds and the chief priests, but I want us to notice the criminals in verse 22 also. Verse 32, that is. And the, Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him, the criminals. They were joining in the chorus of those that were making fun. Can you imagine the emboldenment of these two criminals, one that ultimately believed according to the Luke text, the parallel uh, synoptic gospel, but they are also just simply mimicking and following what the religious leaders are saying and doing. They do not know, they do not understand. They're simply the criminals, they're guilty of crimes, and they mocked him, made fun of him. One believed in uh, the faith, that uh, had placed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine the restraint and the power of the Lord Jesus to stay there and not do something in response? I don't know about you, but when I study a text like this, I look at it and say, how would I respond? What would you do? What would I do? We certainly would not uh, remain silent as the Lord Jesus Christ did with all of that that's taking place. But here's the factor. Jesus Christ is 100% God and 100% man. There's no place in the scripture where there was ever any bifurcation of his deity and his humanity. He was always, always, always 100% God and 100% man. In his humanity, Jesus suffered and bled and died. In his humanity, he was in agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. In his humanity, he was in suffering suffering and pain on the cross, but in his deity, it was determined before the foundation of the world that God the Father would come as God the Son and die on Calvary's cross for your sins and for mine, and therefore in that deity, he sustained himself on Calvary's cross to the end. Every Christian ought to say amen. The realization and the recognition of what we have in Christ. Can you imagine Submission to the Father, the sacrificing of his will to the will of the Father for Jesus to remain on the cross. But he died for you, and he died for me. We've seen the place of the cross recorded, the people of the cross reviewed. But I want us to think for a moment about the pain of the cross. And we can go back and look at verse 24 and 25. In fact, it's the most simplistic statement that's made about Jesus' death on the cross. Simplistic in it simply said, and they crucified him. Succinctly stated. Notice in that 24th verse. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them. Verse 25 then. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Without going into great ramifications or details, they crucified him simply says, in fact, when you look at Mark's gospel, it's the uh, gospel of immediacy because straightway is the major word that uh, Mark uses throughout the gospel of Mark. It's the truncation of what you find in all of the parallel gospels, if you will. But here's the understanding. We need to recognize what happened on that day at Calvary, on Calvary's cross. Notice verse 33 and following also. 
And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness. The sixth hour, it's about noontime. He's crucified at about nine o'clock. Here it is, the sixth hour, that's noontime. Reckoning starts from sun up for the Jewish calendar. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. That's about three o'clock in the afternoon. Three hours of total complete darkness, by the way. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloha, Eloha, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. They didn't understand what he was saying. And one ran, filled a sponge uh, full of vinegar, and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, Let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. Listen to what the Scripture is saying. I want us to notice two or three things about the pain of the cross. I want us to notice, first of all, the scream, the scream. In fact, in the elongated series, Countdown to Calvary, I'll talk about the scream of the cross, the scandal of the cross, the suffering of the cross, etc. But notice the scream of the cross. Why hast thou forsaken me? My God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Here's the picture, theologically speaking, doctrinally and biblically, we need to understand what Jesus is saying. Why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus Christ is God come in the flesh. This is the first time that God the Father has not been in total unity with God the Son, but because Jesus Christ took upon himself the sin of the whole world. Your sins, my sins, the sins of every human being, past, present, and future. Every sin... Think for a moment, ponder for a moment. The vast wickedness and the ugliness and the darkness and the decay that's in the hearts and the lives of humanity. Every sin is placed upon Jesus Christ. And because God is holy, God cannot look upon sin. In that nanosecond, God the Father, back in heaven, in the Spirit, God the Father could no longer look upon God the Son because he literally, theologically, biblically, physically became sin for you and for me. And as a result of that, that uh, precious, precious fellowship of God the Father and God the Son is broken for that nanosecond and Jesus Christ in his humanity cries out, Why hast thou forsaken me? The scream from the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God the Father has turned his back on God the Son. Because he literally became sin for you and for me. The scream and the suffering. Just to say, and they crucified him, is not sufficient. And words will not, are not sufficient to encapsulate for us the understanding of his suffering. So for us to better understand it. I preserved for many, many years. I cannot give credit for what uh, uh, the uh, manuscript of the book that this is out of, but it's out of a book written by a man by the name of Davis. The title of the book is The Crucifixion of Jesus, page 186 and 187. And because of his medical background, he gives a pretty good uh, overview of the actual crucifixion. And he starts out by simply saying, Mark simply says, and they crucified him. We took the, we placed this physically and vividly as described in this fashion. Simon is ordered to place a crossbar on the ground and Jesus is quickly thrown backward with his shoulders against the wood. The soldiers feel the depression at the front of the wrist. He drives a heavy square wrought iron three eighths of an inch by seven inches nail through the wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly moves to the other side and repeats the action, being careful not to pull the arm too tightly but to allow some flexation and movement. The crossbar is then lifted and placed at the top of the uh, vertical beam. The left foot is pressed backward against the right foot, and with both feet extended, toes downward, a nail is driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees moderately flexed. The victim is now considered crucified. As he slowly sags down with more weight on the nails in his wrist, excruciating fiery pain shoots along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails in the wrist are putting pressure on the median nerves, and he pushes himself upward to avoid the, the stretching torment. He places his full weight on the nails through his feet. And again, there's the searing agony of the nails tearing through the nerves between the metatorsal bones of the feet. At this point, another phenomenon occurs. 
as the arms fatigue, uh, uh, great waves of cramps uh, sweep uh, over the muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. These with cramps, uh, with these cramps comes the in, uh, inability to push himself upward. Air can be drawn into the lungs but cannot be exhaled. Jesus fights to raise himself in order to get even one small breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and the blood uh, stream and uh, cramps uh, partially subside. Sporadically, he is able to push himself upward to exhale and bringing in life-giving oxygen. Hours of this limitless pain. Cycles of twisting, joints rending, uh, cramps, uh, intermittent uh, partial asphyxiation. Searing pain as tissue is torn from the lacerated back, he moves up and down against the rough timbers. Then another agony begins. A deep crushing pain in the chest of the pericardium slowly fills with serum and begins to compress the heart. It is now almost over. The loss of tissue fluids has reached a critical level. The compressed heart is struggling to pump heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissues. The tortured lungs are making frantic efforts to grasp a small gulp of air. The body of Jesus is now in extremes. He can now feel the chill of death creeping through his tissues. And finally, death occurs. I believe for the most part, as Christians, we never ponder what Jesus went through for our salvation. The suffering and the suffocation. Jesus literally died of suffocation hanging there on the cross. The tortured lungs could no longer grasp a breath of air, but he died for your sins and for mine. And we must ask the question then, and the final thought of the text is the purpose of the cross reminded. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ die on Calvary's cross? Verse 30 says, Save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking among themselves uh, with the uh, scribes. He saved others, himself he cannot save. What is the purpose of the cross? Why did Jesus Christ come and suffer and bleed and die on Calvary's cross? First of all, for the salvation of man. Salvation of man. The crowds, the chief priests, the scribes, the criminals, the common individual, individual, then and present. Those that laugh at Jesus and mock at Jesus and make fun of Jesus. Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of our sins. May I remind us, they said, save thyself, you saved others. Can you imagine that setting in that day, the others? The man with the legion of demons. Jesus cast the demons out, preserved him physically and saved him. The man with leprosy, the man with palsy, uh, the little dead girl as I call it, the woman with the diseased body, the blind man. Can you imagine uh, the ministry and the message of the Lord Jesus Christ then and now? All over Israel, Jews and others had been helped and healed and those with, uh, that, had, uh, that had deathly dying diseases were made well and healed as a result. The blind men now see, the deaf now hear. In fact, in Matthew one twenty one says, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. There's an old song that says, Years are spent in vanity and pride, Caring, not, knowing not my Lord was crucified, knowing it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. May I remind us, another old song says, Alas, and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Do you know Jesus Christ as Savior and as Lord? not only for the salvation of man, but the sacrifice of the master. Jesus Christ came and died on the old rugged cross. He was nailed to the cross, but those nails did not hold him there. His love for you and for me restrained him from coming down. 
His love kept him on the cross. God did not spare his son, but he died on the cross that we might be spared. He came to pay the price, to be the ransom for many, the scripture says. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. 